Good afternoon. Welcome to the 51st Thresher Memorial Service. I am Lieutenant Alfred Page, United States Navy, retired and chaplain for Thresher Base. We join today to pay tribute honoring the 129 naval personnel and civilians who paid the ultimate sacrifice while serving on the USS Thresher, SSN 593. All those seated who are able, please rise. Attention on deck, color guard, present colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our national anthem. Color guard, retire the colors. Shoulder, arms. Right, face. Forward, march. Fifty one years ago, we were humbly reminded. That, your, that Proverbs 21:31 says that the horse is prepared for battle, but the safety is of the Lord. Today we gather to memorialize those aboard the USS Thresher and to acknowledge that their sacrifice was not in vain. Because they sacrificed their tomorrow, thousands of submariners continue to operate and return home safely today. It was this crew's unshakable bravery and selfless sacrifice that set an unprecedented successful course of submarine safety and performance ability. As we pay tribute to their honorable lives today, guide our thoughts and our words to respectfully remember them. For the friends, family, and loved ones of those lost, we ask that you will comfort and strengthen their hearts today. It is in your holy name we pray, amen. Glad to have our speakers today. This afternoon it is our pleasure to have remarks by Captain William Green, 74th Commander of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. He has been closely associated with the submarine service since 1988. To give the family remarks, joining us today is Vivian Debrusi Lindstrom, 
the daughter of Samuel J. Debrusi, ETN2, SS, USS Thresher, SSN 593. Vivian resides and comes to us from Glenwood City, Wisconsin. We are also glad to have today Retir Rear Admiral John Orzali, United States Navy retired, to bring the keynote address. He was raised in a submarine family and familiar with the seacoast area, continued the tradition in submarine service since 1978. Joining us also with the musicians of Lori Arsenal and Deb Arsenal Henderson, the daughters of ENCA Tillman J. Arsenal of the USS Thresher, SSN 593. They have participated in many of the past Thresher memorial services. Our introductory remarks, Captain William Green, United States Navy, Commander, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Thresher families and former crew members, Rear Admiral Arzali, Thresher base members, submarine veterans, shipmates and shipyarders, distinguished community leaders, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm honored to stand before you today and grateful to the submarine veterans for giving me this opportunity to speak at this very special memorial service. As the 84th Commander of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, I'm privileged to work alongside the very best sailors, engineers, technicians, and mechanics that the nation has to offer. And I can tell you, from the very newest apprentice on the deck plates, to me, the shipyard commander, the loss of the thresher and her crew and the civilians from Sperry, Raytheon, and Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is constantly present in our hearts and at the forefront of our minds. Not a day passes that we work a little harder and we work a little smarter to ensure the highest quality to keep our submarines safe. It's personal to us at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. The loss of the Thresher is more than a part of history. It's a part of the very fabric of the shipyard. Our tradition of handing down trade experience from one generation to the next helps ensure the quality of our work. And the spirit of the Thresher is an ever-present reminder of the importance of that work and the necessity to achieve excellence. So it's both our duty and our obligation to those who made the ultimate sacrifice and all those who vowed never again. So thank you so much for being here today as we pay tribute to these American heroes. Bringing the remarks from the Thresher family, Vivian DeBrusi Lindstrom, daughter of Samuel J. DeBrusi, EN2 SS, USS Thresher, SSM 5. I inherited my dad, the Italian family height.
Good afternoon. My dad, Samuel DeBruzzi II, was born to Italian parents, Sam and Lizzie DeBruzzi. The youngest of nine, he had five sisters and three brothers. He did the typical Catholic school where Italian families always hoped to have one of their sons go into the priesthood and at least one of their daughters to become a nun. My dad's older brother was completing seminary to become a priest and my dad was following close behind. He looked up to his brother, Father James DeBruzzi. My dad finished eighth grade at the Catholic school in his hometown of Hudson, Wisconsin, and went on to Pontifical College, Josephinum in Ohio. After spending two years there and completing his sophomore year, he came back to Wisconsin to finish high school at home. He had decided that the priesthood wasn't what he wanted. He went on to the College of St. Thomas for two years where he studied physics and then enlisted in the Navy in 1956. His goal and passion was to gain skill and knowledge in the electronics and nuclear power for submarine duty, which he did in 1960. He was so proud, so proud in fact, that he named his beagle puppy Dolphin. And he was assigned to Thresher as reactor operator in February 1961. The summer of 1957, my dad came home to Wisconsin for a visit on leave and a friend set him up on a date, blind date, with my mom. It was a whirlwind romance from the very beginning. With my mom and her pretty blue eyes and pretty smile, and my dad with his beautiful brown eyes that crinkled at the corners, and his dark hair. My mom said he had the most beautiful smile of anyone she had ever met. I would give anything just to see that smile just once. My brothers and I have stacks of letters he wrote to my mom along with greeting cards from every possible holiday. They were overflowing with words of love and terms of endearment. He was very sentimental and romantic. I cling to every word he wrote. He tried to break up with my mom in 1958, stating that military life was just too difficult to have a relationship and he didn't want to do that to her. After receiving an angry letter from one of my mom's older brothers, the relationship resumed. They married in September of 1959. My dad made the most of his time with my mom and eventually us when he was home. They would take little trips fairly close to home like going to see President Kennedy at Hyannisport. I was born in July of 1960. My brother Sam, at the time, was Samuel DeBruzzi III, was born in November of 61, and Carl was born in January of 63. On April 9, 1963, my dad, age 26, approached my mom, age 22, to discuss his life insurance and other important papers. My mom got upset and didn't want to discuss it. He was going to come home again anyway. April 10, 1963, hearing of Thresher's possible demise came via television. A young mother with three children under the age of three, the youngest being two months old, and having no family close by, watched the news unfold on the television. April 11th brought media to the door, taking pictures, which is when this picture was taken of my brother Carl. My brother Carl found this picture purely by accident two weeks before the 50th memorial service. He didn't know it, we didn't know it existed. It is the only baby picture he has of himself. My mother had taken some film to the drugstore to be developed and they were all of Carl's baby pictures. But following the devastating loss and the indescribable grief, she never made it back to pick up the pictures. The days following the loss of Thresher were a blur. She put the three of us in the car and drove around aimlessly for about four days. Sarah Wagner, wife of Fern Wagner, formerly assigned to Thresher, came to my mother's aid upon the suggestion of Joan Lyman, who was dealing with her own grief with the loss of her husband, Lieutenant Commander John Lyman. The look on my mother's face in this picture from April 14th, Easter Sunday, 1963, speaks volumes. The looks on our faces as toddlers, we were totally oblivious to the deep, 
grief that was hanging so heavy in the air. Much of what was said and done during the days following the loss of Thresher escaped memory. But unlike Thresher, those memories resurfaced 50 years later, which was a long overdue healing for my mother. Our pain of loss has a way of catching up to us at some point in our lives. We moved back to Minnesota and the Wisconsin area right away to be closer to our families. We were far removed from the everyday reminder of wistfully looking out over the Atlantic. When some friends from Maine came to visit six years later, they asked my mom how she was doing, and her only reply was, I don't want to talk about it. When you're as young as we were, it is hard to grasp the magnitude of your loss. My thoughts mirrored those of other Thresher children. What if my dad really had amnesia from hitting his head and he didn't know where home was? I used to wonder if I would be walking down the sidewalk sometime and pass him and not even know it. In my younger elementary school years, I used to tell the kids at school that my dad was killed in the ocean by a shark. I really did not understand. But years later, I realized that Thresher was named for the Thresher shark. We visited our DeBruzzi grandparents quite often and would spend hours playing and exploring the big house and the huge large yard with the typical Italian garden, abundant with vegetables used in Italian cuisine. One bedroom upstairs in the big old house held treasured items from our dad. I can still smell the smell in that old room with the mothballs that were used to preserve some of my dad's things. Those items have now been divided between the three of us along with numerous Navy belongings, pictures, letters, awards, and achievements that my mother kept lovingly tucked away. The searching didn't end with the exploration of the house my dad grew up in. We could feel it and sense it in our grandparents and all of our aunts and uncles. Every time my mom took us to the annual DeBruzzi picnic or to spend a few nights with grandpa and grandma, we could tell they were studying every nuance of our faces and features. Grandma always had to put her palms on our cheeks and give us big hugs and kisses Grandma was our strongest link to our dad, as we were to her. There was so much love and longing in her eyes when she would talk about my dad. They were searching for our dad in us. They found him in my dark eyes and hair and my hands, in my brother Carl's profile and his gift with science. My brother Sam not only looks like our dad, but also has identical handwriting and the exact same signature as our dad. I've spent a lot of time studying my dad in pictures. I search for my dad and my children and grandchildren. He is there, albeit somewhat less defined, in my son's profile in thin build, my older daughter's eyes, and my younger daughter's hands. As I watch my grandchildren grow, I see my dad and my granddaughter's bright smile and the way her eyes crinkle like crescents at the corners like my dad's eyes did. My brother Sam's granddaughter looks like him when he was three, so we can only guess that as she grows, we will begin to see signs of our dad in her as well. We do see little bits and pieces of our dad in my brother Carl's four daughters through their hair color and features. My brothers and I found that we, over the years we had an intense curiosity about submarines. Anytime there was a documentary on submarines, we watched with a glimmer of hope that something would be mentioned about our dad's submarine. We were always searching for little pieces of information about Thresher. Most of my life, I've been plagued with dreams where I'm always on the water in some way. In one of them, I distinctly remember being on a snowmobile, of all things. I'm always searching for something, but I never find it. Last April, when the events for the 50th memorial service and the flag dedication ceremony had come to a close, we had some time to do a little sightseeing before we went back to the airport. We drove up along the coast and made a few stops to hike around some old forts. At Fort McClary, we went to the underground lookout and looked through the openings in the, in the brick. And my granddaughter, who was 11 at the time, looked out there with me and seeing the ocean for her first time said, my great grandpa is out there, isn't he? I said to her, in a sense he was, but we know where he really is. 
As I was writing this and have reflected over the past year, I came to the startling revelation that I haven't had any more of those dreams. That day at Fort McClary, looking out over the water, I had finally found what I was looking for. I could very strongly sense my dad's presence here. I feel more connected to him here, and I struggle when it's time to head back to the airport. I just want to sit on the beach and stare out over the water. Those dreams ended, but of all the movies I've watched over the years that made me think about my dad, such as Titanic, Hunt for the Red October, The Poseidon Adventure, Pearl Harbor with the sinking of the Arizona and listening to the men pound on the walls inside that ship, and many other movies, I will never again be able to watch The Perfect Storm. I hadn't seen it and watched it one evening a few months ago before going to bed. Although it had nothing to do with the Navy or submarines, I had horrible nightmares that night. I got up and walked the floor the rest of the night. There is something about those men trapped inside that fishing boat, knowing it was going to sink. There is something about the one man who did get out but floated on the rough seas while the filmmakers vocalized his last thoughts of his loved ones. What was everyone thinking about aboard Thresher? How long did they have to think about things? How long were they aware of impending loss? Did my dad have a chance to think about each one of us? But most of all, I pray that when it happened, it happened quickly. The irony of it all is the fact that my dad was definitely afraid of heights. So instead of choosing other Navy vessels that were primarily above the water, he chose submarine life. My dad left behind a daughter and two sons. He has one grandson and seven granddaughters and two bonus grandsons by marriage. His grandson is by me, so he does not carry on the DeBruzzi name. My dad has four great-grandchildren so far from two of the granddaughters, so his legacy has a lot of growing room yet. There were three generations of Samuel DeBruzzi's, my grandpa Sam, my dad, Sammy to his family, Sam to his shipmates, and my brother, Sammy Joe. Sam, Sammy, and Sammy Joe. It would seem that the name Sam would end with my brother. However, Carl's youngest of four daughters and the youngest grandchild of our dad's was born on what would have been Grandpa Sam's 100th birthday. So in honor of this and in memory of our dad, she was named Samantha Joe, and is called Sammy. The memory of my dad and the rest of those lost goes with me everywhere I go. These services have come to mean a great deal to me. Each time I come, I meet more Thresher family members. I can put faces to names of former crew members and friends that I've read about in my dad's letters. I learn new things about my dad. To me, that alone is priceless. I have been truly blessed by everyone I have met and have come to think of them as my extended family. In closing, I would like to share a poem I wrote in 2003 when we were nearing the 40th anniversary, several years before we knew these services existed. My dad, I was born in July of 60, but in April of 63, you were gone. Your arms around me, I cannot recall, but in my heart, they've been there all along. It was April the 10th of 1963 when below the surface, the USS Thresher went. It was only going to be a test dive, but God said no, to heaven these men were sent. As a small child, I always thought about that deep dark water. How could you leave me like this, Dad? After all, I am your daughter. You sang in the Navy choir. I wish I could have heard your voice. But singing to me just wasn't meant to be. It really wasn't your choice. When I look in the mirror and see my eyes and style my dark hair, I see through my life and in my heart there are many things we share. I am now a mother and grandmother. I have children of my own, and along with my grandchildren, they will know of you when they are grown. It has now been 51 years, and I can truly say aloud, you gave your life with honor, Dad, and of you I am so proud. Dear Dad, Samuel J. DeBruzzi, 
with your naval rank of ETN2. I just want to say, P.S. I love you. Thank you. Our keynote speaker, Rear Admiral John Orzali, United States Navy, retired. Admiral. Good afternoon. I'd like to add my welcome to family, friends, shipyard workers, local uh, dignitaries. Um, this, uh, t this ceremony to me is all about remembering and memories. And I was struck when I walked in today because, uh, and I, I know it's in the bio, but I actually went to Trape Academy uh, from 19... 70 to 72, and uh, this is the first time I've been back. And so when you, when you have something, a reminder, and that's gonna be my theme today, of uh, a reminder that brings back vivid memories. And I didn't realize it when I went out into the, uh, the uh, common area out there, they have bricks on the wall with people's names. And I found my sister, who is no longer with us. So I would like to talk about memories and, and how they bring us to today. So my father was in the submarine force. Um, actually, he signed up and started in submarine school in the fall of 1963. I remember as, as a seven-year-old asking him if it was safe because of what had happened on Thresher. And he reassured me that it was okay. Um, I had the opportunity as a 10-year-old to go to sea on USS Barb, a sister ship of Thresher, and uh, to rig the ship for dive. Little did I know then what would come for me in the future. Um, we came to the seacoast area in 1969. My dad was on Sam Rayburn and uh, undergoing overhaul at the shipyard. And I, along with many other base kids, attended schools right here in town. So on my way in this morning, I drove by the community center, which was then the Frisbee Junior High School. And I am a distinguished graduate of the Frisbee Junior High School. But what I didn't realize until later is there were classmates of mine whose fathers were on Thresher. And when I had the opportunity to attend the 50th Memorial last year and saw that my classmate Alba Beal's dad was on Thresher, things started, started coming home. I think that uh, if and I think that's one of the things with memorials, you, it has to be personal. Because if it's not personal, then it's real easy to discount. So knowing that I went to school with folks whose dad was on the ship really uh, caused me to reflect and remember. Um, I didn't graduate from school here. We moved to Northern Virginia. And uh, the high school that I attended there, um, my, uh, fr my best friend in high school there, uh, his dad was the pilot on Trieste that found the Thresher. Another um, memory jogger, so to speak, or another reminder um, as I was uh, growing up. I went to the Naval Academy, graduated, and chose submarine duty. My first tour was actually in submarine development group. And we, uh, 
I actually had the opportunity to make a dive to 3,500 feet on Sea Cliff. And it's dark down there. And the creatures are strange down there. And at that time, Trieste was also part of Submarine Development Group, group One. And so my links to Thresher, I didn't realize it at the time, would continue to grow. When I got finished with training, my first ship was Snook 592. The prior class of ships to, to Thresher. And when I reported on board, I noted that uh, we had significant limitations. In fact, we were the, at least I was told, that we were the last ship in the Atlantic fleet that had not been backfitted with the modernizations known as subsafe. And so when we operated, we severely restricted what the ship could do. But I learned how to be a submariner. I learned that you depended on, with your life, all of those that served with you. And so as I think back to Thresher, everyone on board that ship depended on each other and their, li their lives were intertwined. After, after my tour on Snook, I, I actually got to go to a shore to tour, but then went back as an uh, engineer in new construction on USS Helena. And a couple things happened during that tour. First, um, the, the month that I reported on board, Challenger blew up in the sky. And although Challenger and Thresher are very different, their histories are intertwined uh, for a couple reasons. The first is that Challenger, when it was lost, the people doing the investigation came back and looked at the subsafe program to see how to do it right. And the other connection I'll talk about at the end of my remarks, so hopefully you'll still be awake to hear it. The other thing that, uh, that I was able to see on Helena was a ship under construction and the hard work and effort of those artisans who build and maintain submarines. It's different. It is exacting. And under the subsafe program requires total diligence, never wavering. And so I got to, I got to know the ship better than I thought I would ever know it. From, uh, from Helena, um, I went back to the submarine development group and then on to school and then came back into the shipyard world. I came, at, came back to, uh, as an engineering duty officer, the officers that serve in our, in our shipyards as well as in our um, Naval Sea Systems Command headquarters. And my first tour was at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And just as a side, one of the vi most vivid memories from that tour, I was in the production department. And we had our annual subsafe certification audit. And we failed. We failed because the auditors found material that was not subsafe commingled with the material that was subsafe. And so they said uh, the auditors gave us an opportunity to remedy the situation and left and came back four weeks later. And again, they rapidly found commingled material. So they left again and came back four weeks later. And again, they came back and found commingled material. The shipyard commander at the time was a little irritated and so that was my sole responsibility to clean up the shipyard to make sure that would not happen. So we, um, a significant effort, I had, uh, I got rid of all you shipyard guys, I got rid of every gold pile at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. We don't have those anywhere, do we? 
there was over $5 million of material that was taken out of cubby holes and, and pukas and, uh, and put right. It basically demonstrated to me that if you're going to do it right, you've got to do it right. And there are no shortcuts. And the reason we have the strict and exacting requirements is, is for safety of people. After, that tour, after the tour in uh, Puget, I got the opportunity to come back here to the, to the seacoast, and I was at uh, Portsmouth from 1996 to 2000. And there are many people here today that I had the opportunity to get reacquainted with on my, on my trip back at Portsmouth. There were a couple things happened during that tour besides having the occasion to be at these services, and I actually spoke at one of them. And when the shipyard commander was absent is one of the great responsibilities and pleasures that I, that I had while I was here. But the other thing, as the constant reminder, sometimes you just need a little poke every once in a while to remember. But as the engineering and planning officer, I was going through the uh, compensation report. Um, periodically, uh, you get a report of where the disability claims are being paid. And from the engineering department, there was, uh, I went through the list and I, I was sort of struck because there was uh, a group of six names with a date of commencement of benefits of the 10th of April, 1963. And then, and then it struck me that all of these people had perished on Thresher and I was now responsible for the disability compensation for their loved ones. It's one of those reminders. It, you got to keep it in your mind. You can't let it go. The other thing I realized during that time is there were workers at the shipyard whose dad was on the boat. My head of, uh, that did uh, my planning was Pete Currier, whose, whose father was on, on the boat. Um, I left, uh, left Portsmouth, had a short tour in D.C., and then went back as the shipyard commander in, in Bremerton. And a couple things, uh, re reminders of Thresher during that tour. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure that I brought the work ethic and the dedication of Portsmouth and the firsthand knowledge of Thresher to my new co-workers at Puget. I kept on the corner of my desk a copy of the Navy's report to Congress on the loss of the Thresher, a rather uh, tattered up, um, but not ancient, but very living document. I kept it on the corner of my desk. I actually, uh, as part of the subsafe training, I, I, they filmed me in my office with the manual on the corner of my desk. and. I know they used it for a little while because my son actually went through the training a few years later when he was working at Puget Sound Shipyard and uh, they warned him beforehand that, they, that he might recognize someone in the video. Um, the other thing that came through to me was uh, in getting ships underway after long periods in the shipyard and the requirements to certify that the ship was subsafe and ready to go to sea. My whole team and I would were, and many times, you don't get these things done until very late in the day, like 2300 or close to midnight. And I would go through and personally verify for every reentry control that the objective quality evidence was right. And I did that because it was my signature on the document certifying that everything was correct. But I wasn't the only one that was up late because all the engineers and the program managers at NAVC, which was three hours later, were up waiting for the document so that they could provide the same level of oversight and review to ensure that we had it right. A few years later, I got the opportunity to go back to NAVC as the vice commander, and one of the roles that I had there was as the chairman of the Subsafe Oversight Council where I got the opportunity to review the Subsafe program and the legacy of Thresher firsthand. 
And we were not in the process, we were external to the process, and our role and responsibility was to make sure that we did not get complacent, that we always kept the submarine safety as a foremost in our mind. And so then I got to do a little history. Those of you that uh, are familiar with the SubSafe program, which I think you are, may not recognize that before its implementation, we lost a submarine on an average one every three years in peacetime evolution. So from the start of the submarine force with the Holland in the early 1900s until loss of the Thresher, taking the war years out where we lost ships in battle, we lost a submarine in peacetime once every three years. In the 51 years since loss of Thresher, we have not lost a single submarine that had met the requirements of the SubSafe program in 51 years. That to me is testament to the dedication and the pioneering spirit that was part of the Thresher crew that we who were left behind have the mantle to carry forward. Now, some folks say, well, what about Scorpion? Scorpion was a sister ship of mine on Snook and had not been backfitted with those improvements. So we, any ship that is certified as sub safe, they have all come back. I retired from, retired from the Navy after 34 years. But memories and reminders of Thresher continue. Recent, recently, I was in a conference in in Washington, D.C., and I was talking to one of the other attendees, and I didn't know you were going to be here, Joe, but uh, Captain Joe Urso, who a former shipyard commander here in Portsmouth, was actually a junior officer on the waterfront when Thresher was lost, and knew some of the people on board, and so I, uh, I, we just started talking, and I told him I was going to be up here, and he relayed even more details about Thresher that, that I didn't know. So there are constant reminders of, uh, of Thresher. Um, and some of them even got a little close, per, closer because uh, um, when I got married, uh, my best man is from the seacoast. And uh, his younger sister married Tim Nunes, whose, uh, whose father was on the boat. Um, so I, I keep getting drawn back. And uh, those little reminders, those memory joggers are constantly there. But for many of you in the room, many of you that are here today, memories of your father or of your brother, of your son, your shipmate, uncle, those memories don't need a reminder. They don't need a memory jogger. They're there every day, all the time. And my biggest concern is that as we gray, that we don't have those reminders. We don't have those things that are alive today. There have been some things done. When I drove in today, I drove by the 129-foot flagpole with the granite stone out in front. The seacoast area, we get it. I'm not concerned. Our own Thresher base here, whose charter from 1989 is to preserve the memory and the honor of the 125 men lost on Thresher. So I'm working very diligently with current post commander Kevin Gallias and others on establishing a permanent memorial for Thresher at Arlington. This past week, we submitted artist renderings of a monument that people in the company I currently work for have donated their time to develop because I am convinced that the legacy of this ship will live here, but it needs to be everywhere. And so 
I'm working to make sure that that happens. And I actually made a commitment a couple years ago when I was at NAVC, and one of our keynote speakers was one of our musicians today, Lori. I told her that I would continue to work on establishing that memorial. So it's, it's not just personal, it's a commitment. So, um, so I appreciate the opportunity. I actually have some notes and I wanna make sure I don't, don't mess up the last part. And that, that is, these services are for the families. To, keep the, to help to assist to keep those memories alive. The bonding that you have between each other that have, that have gone through the same types of experiences. And to me, the, the real strength, yes, we have strength in the Subsafe program, but the strength is among you families. That strength that you demonstrate year after year is both remarkable and contagious and I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of it thank you very much Lori and Deb are at Arsenal Daughters of E.N.C. Tillman J. Arsenal, now play, sing the Navy hymn. Thank you, Lori and Deb. The tolling of the bells is a time-honored tra tradition of the submarine veterans 
as we honor shipmates and fellow submariners now on eternal patrol. The tolling of the bell reminds us of the reverence we owe to our departed shipmates, and to those who guard the honor of our country while serving silently under the sea. In many ways, tolling the bell formally restates to our officers and enlisted personnel who presently serve aboard U.S. submarines that their deeds and sacrifices follow in the footsteps of their fellow shipmates who preceded them. Our readers today are Frank Hood, Thresher Base Clerk, Secretary, and John Ryman Snyder, former crew USS Thresher, and bell toller is Robert Flannery from Thresher Base, and Piper is Mr. Patrick Boyle. Fred Philip Abrams. Philip Harcourt Allen. Tillman Joseph Arsenault. Ronald Claire Babcock. Ronald Eugene Bain. Daniel W. Beal, Jr. John Edward Bell. Robert Donald Biederman. John Hillary Billings. Edgar Solon Bobbitt. Gerald Charles Boster. George Bracy, Richard Paul Brand, Richard James Karkowski, Patrick Wayne Carmody. Stephen George K. Robert E. Charon. Edward Christensen. Larry William Colossum. Thomas Edward Clements. Merrill Francis Collier. K. 
Kenneth Ray Corcoran. Kenneth James Critchley. Francis Michael Cummings. Paul Chevalier Courier. Samuel Joseph de Bruzzi. Clyde Elcott Davidson III. Donald Clifford Day. Roy Overton Denny Jr. Richard Roy Desjardins. Peter Joseph Dabella. George J. Deneen. Michael John Denola. Don Roy Dundas. Troy Earl Dyer. Richard K. Fisher. Elwood Henry Forney. Raymond Peter Foti. Larry Wayne Freeman. Gregory Joseph Fusco. Joseph Andrew Gallant Jr. Napoleon Tomas Garcia. John Edmund Garner. Pat Mahaffey Garner. Robert William Gaynor. Robert Howard Gosnell. John Gilbert Grafton. William Edward Graham. Paul Alfred Garrett. Aaron Jackie Gunter. Richard Charles Hall. John Wesley Harvey. Norman Theodore Hayes. Laird Glenn Heiser.
Marvin Theodore Helsius. James John Henry Jr. Leonard Hogan Togler Hewitt. Joseph Hartshorn Hogue. James Porter Hodge. John Francis Hudson. John Penfield Inglis. Frank Maurice, Maurice Frank Jacquet. Ronner Garth Johnson. Richard Lee Johnson. Robert Eugene Johnson. Thomas Benjamin Johnson. Richard Williams Jones. Edmund Joseph Calusa. Thomas Charles Gantz. Robert Dennis Kearney. Ronald Dean Kyler. George John Kiesecker. Billy Max Clyer. Robert Lee Craig. George Ronald Croner. Donald William Closer. Norman Gilbert Lanawet. Wayne Wilford Lavoy. John Sheldon Lyman. Templeton Norwood Maybe Jr. Frank John Malinsky. Richard Herbert Mann, Jr. Julius Francis Murillo, Jr. Douglas Ray McClellan. Donald James McCord. Carl Paul McDonough. Sidney Lynn Middleton. Henry Charles Moreau. Ronald Arthur Muse. James Alton Musselwhite. Donald Emery Nault. Walter Jack Nunes. John Daniel Norris. Chesley Charles Oding. Franklin James Palmer. Guy Carrington Parsons, Jr. Rostow Cleveland Pennington. James Glenn Peters. Frank James Filippi. Daniel Andrew Philput. Richard Podwell. Robert Dan Prescott. 
John Sage Regan, James Patrick Ritchie, Purvis Robertson, Glenn Alva Roundtree, Anthony Alexander Roshetsky, James Michael Shiwi, Benjamin Nathan Schaefer, John Davis Schaefer, Joseph Thomas Shimko, Burnett Michael Shotwell, Alan Dennison Sinet, John Smars Jr., William Harry Smith Jr., James Leonard Snyder, Ronald Hall Sullivan, Donald T. Studmuller, Robert Edwin Steinell, Roger Edwin Van Pelt, Joseph Alfred Walski, David Allen Wassel, Lawrence Eugene Witten, Charles Lewis Wiggins, John Joseph Wiley, Donald Edward Wise, Ronald Eugene Wolf, J. Henry Zweifel, I'd like to thank all those in attendance today and would like to recognize our, all our submarine veterans who have come from the various bases all over the New England area. Main Base, Thrusher Base, Marblehead Base, Boston Base, and maybe others besides. We thank you for all coming out today. In the early 1960s, Thrusher pulled into Key West, tied up at Pier 1. The boat was open to tours for any diesel boat sailors that wanted to look over a state-of-the-art nuclear submarine. I was stationed on board SeaCat at the time. And we went down and took the tour. We were dazzled by the space that the crew had, the amount of room, the full air conditioning, and all the fresh water you wanted. Some of the guys looked at it. One in particular that I remember was electronic te technician first class, Troy Dyer. He went to Thresher. Later on, I served on the USS Darter, SS-576. She was a recipient, one of the few diesel boats to have the subsafe package beneficiary of Thresher. They shall all be remembered. All those seated, would you enable, would you please rise? Ch Chaplain Robert Price, Lieutenant Robert Price will give the benediction. Let us pray. Eternal Father, once again we, we thank you for the lives of those aboard 
USS Thresher, who have paved the way for us today, may we never forget. They gave their dreams, their plans, and their struggles that we might have the best. Their sacrifice is quiet, but their lives are love expressed. Let their spirit be the driving force that makes our silent service and community stronger and safer as we dive deep into the future. God, please grant that these men of principle be our principal men today. We ask all these things in the name of the Maker and Master of the Sea. Amen. The wreath laying ceremony will take place at the water's edge and you're all dismissed to retire to there. Out the door and straight towards the river. <laughs>